Um, okay, so I'm here to talk about strategy and budget. I'm really happy to be here in London for my second Games You Are. It's a really great experience. Uh, I hope you have all had a coffee or three this morning because there are not one, but two spreadsheets in this presentation. <laughs> so bear with me. We'll get through it, all of us together. Let's dive right in. So first, quickly, let's get this out of the way. Some introductions. My name is Jonathan Dankoff. I've been a user researcher for approaching 15 years. I did a quick first little decade at uh, Ubisoft, and since then I've been at Warner Brothers, where I'm now the senior manager of research. Uh, some thanks for this presentation. My team, obviously, at Warner Brothers, my fantastic team, who have mostly let me push this process onto them. Uh, Nick at Ubisoft, who was the first to force me to really think about strategy. I gave him a really hard time about it when he first made me do it, but now I really see the value. Um, Seb at Player Research for putting this all together, for forcing me to come and give this talk, even though I didn't think it would be very interesting. Uh, and for continuously pushing our discipline forward and really, uh, you know, getting everybody on the same page. And then finally, Tom over at Microsoft, who was my coach, who desperately tried to find a way to fit some sort of narrative or through way into a talk that's about documents. But, you know, we'll see if he, if he nailed it. Uh, so first, why bother? Um, a wise man that I work with once told me that any attempt to do this type of exercise always just devolves into a giant pack of lies. And to that I answered, well, failing to plan is planning to fail, Benjamin Franklin, Jonathan. Um, and so I try not to think of it, you know, hopefully you'll see uh, that creating a good strategy is less of a pack of lies and more something like a collection of very hopeful half-truths made in best intentions with good reasoning and solid logic behind it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the past, where I started from, where this all sort of originated. Uh, as a younger man, the first time Nick asked me to do a strategy, and Nick was my boss at Ubisoft at the time, uh, I was borderline insubordinate. I didn't take it seriously. I thought it was very silly. At that point, I had already made a half dozen Assassin's Creed games. I knew how to test them. I knew what it was. I had all this tacit knowledge. Uh, there was no sense in trying to write it all down. You know, The team trusted me implicitly uh, to do what they thought was best. There was really no reason to try to work backwards from what I was already doing to write it down. It was just a waste of time. Um, what he pointed out was, well, you know, how are you adapting for the change? You know, Assassin's Creed is an innovative series. Every year on year, if they do a new thing, how are you changing your plan? Is there any rationale behind it? And I sort of was playing it by ear. Um, he also said, you know, all of this sort of contained knowledge that you have, what will happen if you quit? And spoiler, I quit. So uh, it's important to get this all out there and get your strategy on paper. Um, the next thing that's really you know, important to think about is uh, this idea of like waiting by the bat phone. I see a lot of young faces in the room, so I'm just going to quickly explain the old Batman, before he had the giant light, had a little red phone on his desk that the mayor could call him when something bad happened, which I think you know, is something most of you have seen in your user research where a developer will give you a shout and say, ah, everything's you know, messed up, quick, come help us. But I think everybody recognizes that reactive user research is not the best kind of user research. And without a strategy or a planning, you're probably going to revert to this. Uh, and I think we all strive to be more than just firefighters, or I guess to stretch the analogy, crime fighters. But um, Next is looking at resource planning. So without a decent strategy, there's no way for you to look forward in time and to understand what it is that you're going to need. Right? Again, at UB, when I didn't think any of this was worth doing, um, I had a lab manager who was there to make sure that he was looking at everybody's work and putting it all together and trying to like puzzle out what we needed to get. But without any form of strategy, it becomes very difficult. Like, you know, how long do you need to look out if you need to hire more staff, if you need to get a bigger room, if you need to uh, buy new tools or software or something? A lot of these things have months and months of lead time. And if you're on a purely reactive basis, you're going to get caught uh, you know, unprepared, and you're not going to be able to deliver the best results to your team. Finally, there's the idea of this locus of control, right? If, so if you're not doing a strategy, it's quite likely, or at least hopefully, somebody is thinking about user research in a way that you aren't. And even though they're well-meaning, if this is done by a producer or somebody else outside of the research group, um, you know, despite best intentions, they may not understand the scope and scale of, of testing that is necessary to support their game and then you know, hand you over a plan that's just three focus groups two months before launch, which let's never do that, please. So I guess all of this is to get to the idea of like, just don't make a plan. You want to start with a strategy. Eventually, you're going to have to make a plan, but do the strategy first. We'll get to the plan part after. 
So I think it's useful to uh, you know, define what I'm talking about by negation, make sure they're all on the same page with strategy is. And so I just want to talk about quickly what strategy isn't. Uh, and what are the things that, in large part, I thought it would be the first time I was asked to do it. Uh, the first is it's not just a giant pile of long, boring documents uh, with tons and tons of documentation and record keeping and lots and lots of, you know, rando typing that nobody's ever going to look at. It's also not just a series of metrics. It's very important to realize that you're not just trying to make sure, like, oh, our strategy is to hit 4.2 on controls. That's not a strategy. Uh, it's also not cobweb files. The goal isn't to write this all up, throw it into a network drive, and then walk away from it forever. That's also a terrible plan. And then finally, um, it's important to remember, it's not an ironclad contract. So when you're building this strategy and you present it to the team, the hope is that you are very flexible and you build it in a way that you can adapt. Uh, so you're not trying to get them to sign in blood that they're going to follow this to the letter for the next three years. You're trying to show them your mindset and how you're approaching it. And it's not high concept nonsense. It's not meant to be a bunch of buzzwords or really silliness. It's supposed to be very actionable, very clear to the team what you're talking about. So what should it be? Hopefully, if you're doing it right, you're trying to understand what does success actually look like for your game. And Below that, what does success look like for you as a research team to deliver good research to that team? Uh, what are the issues that you're trying to solve? Again, both on the design front and on the research front. So are there interesting you know, problems that the team or innovations that they're working on that will require equal innovations from your team of how you're going to solve or how you're going to support the decision-making process while they're working on their game? Uh, it should help you understand where your priorities are and where you need to be putting your efforts and how you should be thinking about how you're going to support the game. And ideally, you want a really long-term outlook, right? So again, moving away from uh, very reactive, very um, firefighty type research into making sure that you have some sort of framework to work against and really consider where the game is headed and how long you have and what types of studies go at what time. Just, I have to quit twice at a time, okay. Just a, a quick way of seeing it, in my head at least this is very clear, but is that there's sort of a hierarchy of framework here, right? So I don't think you're ever going to get away from the bat phone. The bat phone exists. Every once in a while, a developer will call you in a panic. There is a, a planning and a schedule that you need because you want something to show, and it has to be very clear. Um, and you, you ideally want a strategy. And each layer can disrupt the other in interesting ways. But if you get a call on the bat phone and you already have a plan, you're able to much easier say, oh, actually, we already have a study next week booked. I can maybe adjust it or add some stuff to the objectives. And if your calendar changes, so let's say hypothetically, uh, mild, like a major milestone slips or something happens, rather than panicking and having to sort of rebuild a plan, you can refer to the rational way that you built it in order to adjust. And so having you know, these successive layers helps you be much more uh, agile and responsive to what's happening with the team and make sure that you're not uh, missing anything. So let's get into actually how to make it. And hopefully uh, you're at least as excited about this as one of the other people that I work with who told me, yeah, okay, that makes sense, I guess. So we'll go through. Uh, so step one, the first thing is researching your research. So you don't start with documentation. I think there's, there's really two things that you're looking for and one way that you need to go about getting those things. And I don't think there's, you know, you, there's never been a full day conference about games user research where somebody didn't talk about making allies on the dev team, so I'll go quickly through that. But essentially, that's your step one, is you've got to find some champions, some people that trust you, some people that understand at least a little bit about the process. Uh, and you need to understand what their concerns are, what they are, what their risks are, what their innovations are, what they're thinking about when it comes to their game. They don't even need to be talking to you from a user research perspective. They can just be telling you about their game. Uh, they need to have enough um, authority to give you some sort of documentation. So you need somebody that's relatively able to get stuff when you need it. But really what you're looking for from them is two things, scope documents and timeline documents. Uh, so scope documents, the idea here is you're looking for, every studio does this different, every game has this different, but you're trying to understand what is the game that you're gonna be working on and what is the game that you're gonna be supporting. And so this can be like a scope map, it can be a creative brief, it can be a video pitch, it can be, uh, sometimes it's even like the onboarding page for new employees who have arrived in the studio their first day, what's the game that they're gonna be working on. But you're just trying to get a high-level understanding of what are the features, components, and sort of the, 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 pro the player promise of the game that you're trying to work with. And then the next, you're looking for some form of timeline. 
again, this varies from studio to studio, but hopefully they have you know, either some idea of you know, when are their major bill drops or what are their timelines look like? You know, are they alpha, beta release? Are they pre-prod, prod, post-prod? But you're gonna get some form of idea of you know, how am I gonna frame all of these things together in a timeline that makes sense? Uh, ideally, you start this process at the very beginning of the game. But if for whatever reason you're being rolled on late, you can do this at any point, right? The idea of creating a sound strategy doesn't need to happen three years in advance. You can do it if you're getting rolled on a little bit late and you can try your best to understand what their challenges are that are remaining and map those. So now that you've done, you've gotten all the stuff you need, you've done all your preparation, now is the time to start building this document, your strategy pitch. Uh, and the way that I see it, there's three major pieces to that. The first is you need to discuss your approach, then you talk about the high level strategy uh, and your rationale, and then obviously the actionable part, which is your plan and your budget. Oh. Has that been there the whole time? The mouse was right in the middle. Anyway, uh, so obviously the first thing you need to do is discuss your approach, and this is an introduction. Uh, so you need to be talking about um, you know, who you are, what your approach is, what methods do you use. Uh, you're gonna be talking through this plan with people who have drastically different levels of UX maturity and understanding. And so you need to make sure that you are getting them on the same page as you, that they understand the value of your research. Uh, some of these people may not know the difference between a UX designer making wireframes or QA uh, versus user research. So you wanna talk them through all of the different portions um, it, again, you know, just broadly speaking, what you're trying to do is demonstrate, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You're trying to demonstrate that you have a subject matter mastery and you're trying to build a little bit of trust there with these people who you may not know you or it may be the first time that you're working with them. Uh, you want to talk to them about your strengths, how you work, what you do. Um, I'm, as opposed to the rest of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, I'm actually not going to show you my version of this because I do genuinely believe that building this out as part of an exercise for your team and yourself is very important. To really sit down and reflect, where are my strengths and my weaknesses? How do I support the team? What is my approach? Uh, you know, this is different between if you're publisher uh, side user researcher, if you're a developer side researcher, if you are an independent researcher working uh, on as a consultancy, you should have a very, very drastically different opening statement of how do you work, who do you think you are, and how can you help? And I think, you know, just as, as an exercise of doing it, it's quite valuable. This, you want it around 10, 15 minutes. There's no point in going in, like, really deep into the weeds of, like, how do you, what are your methods, this and that. But you want to show how you're able to support and what it is that you're able to do. All right, so now you get into the thick of it. This is the fun part. So now, once you've got that scope document, what you need to start doing is taking apart the game from a player's perspective and understanding what is the game. Uh, here, really what you're trying to understand is if you distill the game down to its sort of bare elements and the most important things, so games don't have boxes anymore, but back when I was a kid, you had back of the box features. That's kind of the idea of what you're looking for, of what are these things that really deliver on the player promise and the key innovations of the game. And you're gonna try to make them into like three to five buckets that reasonably represent the game. And then in, in a part of a presentation that is always super awkward, you want to present that back to the developer of the game to make sure that you've got it right, which can be a little difficult. Um, I've made a very silly fake example. Of course, it's a battle royale game because that's the only thing that gets made anymore. Uh, but so ideally, like let's say you have this scope plan and you're looking at all the different portions of this game, you see that the game is really, the team is very focused on three sort of brackets and these may not be clearly documented in this way, but you're just trying to understand how can I put this game together in a way that makes sense uh, and sort of covers all of the hot topics in it? And so, you know, let's say this game is, uh, it's in space or whatever, and, you know, you see a lot of work on having best-in-class 3Cs. Uh, they have crazy 360 flight controls, perfect one-to-one -one map juggling controls. Uh, then you see, as you're looking around in other places, that there's a really big story uh, that's very important to the way that it works. There's this giant galaxy map, there's dungeons, 10,000 simultaneous players in a week-long battle royale. Uh, and those all tend to be very content-driven portions or features of this component. So I dump them into one bucket called content. And then the last component, I have features like, well, these are all features that uh, 
the component isn't a thing, it's more of an idea, right? So th in this case, I'm talking about progression mechanics and progression ideas. So you have like deep ship RPG, cosmetics, and through monetization, you become an actual literal god. It's very important here that you realize that not every game should have even remotely similar components or features, right? What you're trying to distill is what is it that makes this game this game and not another game? Uh, the core part of the strategy is trying to figure out why you test the game that you're working with differently than another. You shouldn't have an identical test plan for a mobile game as you have for a AAA, which I think is self-evident, but this is part of the reflection of how do you make sure that difference is there. So if you were working on mobile, you'd probably have uh, like UI, engagement, um, some other metrics, each with their own different pieces that you would solve separately. So from there, once you've got a good mapping of what this game is and how you need to approach it, or how you need to think it, you want to start looking at it now from a user research perspective rather than from a player's perspective. Uh, so you should also have some really good ideas of, based on what this game is, how, do I need, how can I support these elements? What are the things that I need to do to make sure that they are successful? And what do I need to do to make sure that my research is successful at providing that good data? And in some cases, this is going to be a study type. But in other cases, it's completely different types of considerations, right? So you may need to buy new equipment. You may need to uh, plan for a larger lab, stuff that we talked about earlier. And so going back again to my very silly example, uh, what you're looking at here, right? So let's say with 3Cs, if they are making completely brand new types. Sorry, for everybody who doesn't know 3Cs because it's kind of a UB-ish term, it, some people call it game feel, some people call it controls, if there's a couple different terms for it. But the idea here is, if they're trying to innovate in that space, well, then you need to be supporting that. And so one of the ways you can do that is via early prototyping, through iterative rips. Uh, did I mention it's VR? Of course it is. Uh, and so here's an example of a consideration that isn't necessarily a research consideration, it's a purchasing one. So if, if the game is VR and you want to support it, then you want to be planning ahead of time in your budget, getting approval, that you're going to have to buy and set up a room with a VR rig to make sure that you're able to run these studies. Uh, you know, you're going to want to plan advanced narrative tests. Here's another different type of consideration just to give you another example. If there's 10,000 players, you're probably not going to have a 10,000 person lab. So you maybe want to ask the team now, uh, hey, do you think it's possible to have some simulated AI opponents so that we can actually run this through some studies that might work? Uh, you'll probably want to plan for an open beta. The other interesting thing here is that being able to do this in advance helps you pitch more innovative, interesting study designs than are possible sometimes when you're right in the thick of it and you're pulling things out of nowhere. So you can get buy-in on stuff like, I know generally speaking, narrative testing can be touchier when you're proposing it to a team, but if you have it sort of approved as part of a plan, it's easier to get, the, get your good ideas through as when they're part of a sort of comprehensive strategy. Uh, you're also looking at longer walkthroughs, and then obviously if there's uh, dog cosmetics, you're going to want real puppies to test it. I think that goes without saying. So now you understand the game. You understand your research challenges. Uh, now is the time to take that strategy and put it into a plan, make it into a calendar. Right? So what you want to do, and let's try this. Uh, uh. This doesn't look so bad. All right, so what you want to do now is you have a general sense of the timeline of the game, because that's in another document that you've had. Uh, you have a general sense of what are the pieces, what are the components, how does that all work? Just for the record, uh, in case you didn't read the program, but you're all going to have access to this document. I'm putting it up for free on Google Drive. Well, I mean, obviously for free, I'm not going to charge you. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so everybody will have this. I'll set up a link afterwards, and you can download it and modify it however you see fit. You can change it. Uh, please share it back to me if you are allowed. But essentially what you're doing now is you have a few columns, and I'm going to head over here. But what you have is your calendar. You have your milestones. So you want to start mapping in all of the milestones that you have that you're able to make sense of, right? So if you have monthly code drops or if you have major milestones, uh, you can even start throwing in, like, if you know from your scope document what is coming in PP9. So let's say hypothetically, you know that their UI alpha at PP9, well, then that's a good time now to say, well, if I'm supporting UI, this is a good place to put that type of study. If you're supporting these other activities, these are other good places to put them. Um, 
I have it set up in case you have two labs. This can be useful if you, say, are running some studies in-house and sending some studies to a vendor, if you have multiple locations, if you have two rooms in the same lab and you want to account for how they're working. There's a number of different ways to use that. And then the idea here is to just have a very high level objective of making sure that it's clear which part of the game you think is worth testing at that point and why, and making sure that that's clear both to yourself and to your development team. Here you bring back the components that we talked about. So when you break apart the game and show it to the team and make sure that like this, these are the components you agree are the main things that need to be successful in your game for your game to be a success. So what you want to do is put those components back into your planning. This becomes very useful later if milestones shift, if the team wants to cancel a study for whatever reason, and you can say, okay, that's fine. But you understand now, for example, here, uh, I think I purposely set this up so you can see, for example, like if they were to cancel this one, we don't have any more progression-based studies for like nine months. Is that a huge risk? And rather than just canceling tests and rebooking tests willy-nilly and just sort of shifting them around, you are now having a really rational conversation about which features are we adding risk to and which features are we removing risk from because it's part of a holistic view of the game and how it all works. Um, so yeah, putting those in there, that's the component column. And then here I have what I like to think of research adjacent activities that are also very important to keep in mind. So for example here, if you know, I work a lot with telemetry, I'm sure most of you do as well. Uh, it's important to have the parts of the things, uh, the parts that they need to contribute to on your plan because you are connected, right? So if you need, you know, if you're gonna run, say for example, a beta, I think I have one of those later, it's a good idea to say, or see here at Alpha, I'm running a huge study, for example. And I want all of my economy tags in because progression becomes very important. You want that sort of built into this plan so that everybody's on the same page of what am I expecting from my stakeholders and my collaborators. Uh, it's also a good idea to put in studies that aren't yours, that are not research studies necessarily or that other groups are running within your organization. Because often there will be, I think we've all seen fallout from one other group's study landing in your lap, and you want to make sure to be prepared for it and to know that something's either you're going to have to help them going in or you're going to want to help them coming out of it. And then there's room for like other major like industry milestones like E3. I mean, this is the way that I've set it up. Uh, I'm assuming that a lot of you are already looking at this and thinking, well, oh, that's fine but I would tear it up and change this and put this column there and do that there. And I, th I think that's the hope, that's the reason that I'm sharing it. It's not to have you copy paste it, but rather to have you go, oh cool, like a lot of the basic work is done, but this guy doesn't understand anything about how I actually do my job and I'm gonna fix it so that it works for me. And I'm hoping that's the way that you see this as well. So let's try, let's do this. Switching to it works, switching back, not as obvious. Come on. I almost got it. F11? Do it. Anyway, we'll go like this, because I'm going back to another document in a second. So now you've got it all set up in your timeline. Uh, you have a good planning. You have everything sort of in place. You've done the Tetris thing of saying, OK, if I test this component here and I test that component there, I get good coverage of all the features. I'm making sure to hit all of the major elements of the game. Uh, I'm confident that this is a solid plan. It's not too aggressive. It's not a weak plan. I have a, I have a good idea. Uh, how much does that cost? <laughs> so use a calculator, mine, and tempting fate. There we go. So the idea here is, I, the, again, this, this is given away for free. You guys will have this at the end of the thing. Um, but there's a cost calculator that I use. Uh, it's, it's relatively simple. I can't see that far, but let's do it from here. So um, this cost calculator basically is you enter just a bunch of variables, and depending on how you've set it up, uh, you can see you know, how many days per session. All of these have tool tips, so it should be relatively easy for you to use yourself and to adjust. But how many, how many you know, days, how many participants, how many compensated backups are you sending home? Um, primary research days, that one's kind of neat because Let's say you enter here that you got you know, a 10-day study. It'll automatically adjust the number of study days 
and assuming that you have three days of prep and three days of reporting, it'll automatically give you the number of recommended days. And if you go here, that'll automatically update the first number in there, which isn't particularly fancy, but I'm not super good at Excel, and I'm pretty proud of that. So <laughs> I thought I would share it. Uh, and then you have you know, a couple of different things here. Um, you know, what's your participant compensation look like? How much are you paying them? Uh, do you have additional researchers lending manpower for a short amount of time that you want to add in to make sure that that's built into your costs? Uh, do you have any miscellaneous costs? Like, are you buying hardware? Or is there anything weird that you need to do in order to make this study work? And then finally, I include just a little fudge factor. If you're doing something new, throw 10% at it, because you'll probably get it a little bit wrong. If you're doing something crazy, add 20%. It won't hurt. <laughs> and then um, that'll pump out a, a cost total. I recommend here you'll want to make sure here, you know, you can quite easily change what all the values are. I made up some numbers. I changed them from the original, but here they are. So there's you know, a researcher hourly rate, whatever your hourly rate is. Don't put your actual hourly rate, right? You want to pad it a little. Um, and then there's a management charge. I do that per day. And you can change the way the formula works if you want to have it different. But the way we see it is, for every research full day, there should be a little bit of overhead for the lab uh, to make sure that we're accounting for some of those costs. And then you want to punch out a couple of these, put them back into the, the research planning. That's a good idea if you have some that are recurrent that you're making over and over again, copy paste them into another slide so that you don't have to remake them every single time you change the calculator. It's not a bad idea. And then you go back into your fake game planning, in your case, a real game planning. And let's open this bad boy up. Oh, it's working. And so you don't necessarily want to have that tab open all the time. Some, you know, some stakeholders maybe don't need to be apprised of all the budget, but you clearly need to have a budget. And so what you do is you go in and you map in uh, all of your costs for all of your different studies. These are not act properly calculated, but they're just in there. Uh, and you can see you know, how much are you working on, how much are these different exercises going to cost. It adds them up monthly, so you get a good idea. And then if you continue over, you get uh, a grand total, which uh, again, fake numbers, fake game, but um, it's a good idea to be able to get this envelope approved and to understand, you know, for the, for the scope and scale of testing that you are recommending, how much does this cost? Uh, rather than sort of working backwards from an envelope that your producer gave you that you have no idea if it's going to be appropriate or enough, uh, this is a much better way to have a rational conversation about, hey, you know, it, this is what I think it's going to cost. If your budget is much lower, then let's go back to the strategy. We can talk about how we want to cut or where we think it can, where we can be uh, a little bit lighter. Um, you can also use this to make, for example, an aggressive schedule and a less aggressive schedule and say, if you want you know, the most support I can give you, it'll cost about this. If you want less, it can cost about this. Uh, and that's, that can be quite useful as well. And where's the mouse now? I don't recommend doing this. <laughs> Why doesn't I go full screen anymore? OK, so now you've got your, you got your approach, you've got your strategy, you've got your planning, you've got your budget, and now you've got to present it to your stakeholders. So you've got to get everybody in the room together, and it should take about 45 minutes ideally because you want to leave room for adjustment because you will get parts wrong. Obviously, when you're explaining that somebody's baby back to them, uh, they're going to have some adjustments for you. Uh, they may cringe at the, at, the, at the budget, and you may have to adjust that. Things are going to change. That's fine. And hopefully, this has been clear because I repeated it a few dozen times. But if you have the strategy, adjusting is a lot easier because there's a rationale behind all the things that you're doing. And you can quickly go back and say, OK, well, if this is moved, or this stretches, or this changes, I will refer back to the way that I built it. Uh, rather than just you know, having, for example, like a copy-pasted calendar that I say, we're going to test once a month. Uh, so you're going to refer back to your framework, you're going to review all your assumptions, and then hopefully, at that point, you get sign-off. That's not the last step. There's one final step, step infinity. <laughs> and the idea here is you need to keep this document alive. Uh, all of this is relatively useless if you don't keep it updated, you don't keep it alive, you don't keep it actualized. Uh, I'm the first to admit keeping documents alive is super hard. They're no fun. It's like the worst version of Tamagotchi. Uh, but you need to find a way to keep it going and to keep it in front of people. And there's a couple of small tricks that you can do to do that. 
One is to make sure to put it somewhere where everybody is looking at it, and just shame will keep you updating it. Because if it gets too out of date, it's embarrassing. Uh, so put it, you know, maybe your team has a confluence and you can put it in a frame in the confluence. Maybe you put it in your network folder. Maybe you publish it somewhere else. But you ideally uh, want people thinking, when, oh, when's our next test? Rather than, oh, I'll hit up Johnny on Skype or Slack. You want them to think, oh, I know where that is. I had it bookmarked. I'll go check. And then if you have it updated, it, that is not good. Um, another idea, you know, is uh, you could use it to link back your reports because it's... Uh, you can put the objective, and then it becomes a much easier way. If you've ever like tried to crawl through a file system of like your reporter, and most people don't keep a very pretty structure in their file system, so you can use this to easily link, and people can see by calendar. They can click to it and say, "Oh, this is when this study was run. This is what the objective was," and that's another way to keep it updated. And then the last one is, and I skip through this, and let's go back one more time is to keep your actuals in. And so I don't know how many of you work with like your financial group uh, at your organization, but you can get, generally you can get actuals month on month. And what you can do now is punch your actuals into there and get a monthly accounting and keep track of, well, am I in reasonably in the right neighborhood of how much I said I was gonna cost? Uh, are things going well? Do I need to adjust my strategy? Do I need to rescope the research that I'm running? Uh, you know, let's say you get that fireman call uh, and you need to drastically change something, how much does that impact your budget? Where do you need to pull away from? Or, you know, it at least gives you a sense of, do I need to go and talk to the team again about opening that envelope a little bit more? And then, so if any of you want to get the jump, I'm not sure how me and Seb are going to publish these links out. They're maybe Twitter or something, maybe Discord. Uh, they'll be out there to find, but if you want to take a picture so that you can get the jump on everybody and have these documents first, go ahead. Uh, was that it? Everybody, I see a lot of phones going down unhappily. I'll go back for one more second. We're good? So, I mean, again, you know, this is a talk about documents, so there's not a, t a ton of really insightful takeaways, I don't think. Hopefully, the value of this talk will come when you take the, the things that I've put out there, you adjust them, you adapt them to your organization, you adapt them to your own needs, you take some of the ideas that you liked, you transform them, uh, but really you start thinking about it from a more uh, long-term and strategic perspective rather than just re reactive uh, and sort of cookie cutter. That's my least favorite way to think about research is just like, well, we had this plan, it worked on the other game, we'll take it, we'll do it on this game. Um, what you really want to try to do is understand the challenges. And so, right, that's, that's essentially leading with a custom player-focused strategy. So look at the game from a player's point of view and try to help the team um, be successful in all of those major components. Uh, again, obviously being flexible is very important, right? The, the goal here is, part of the reason I keep saying to keep it alive is it needs to be something that reflects the reality of the team. And you will find at certain points that maybe a component, uh, let's say for example in my garbage uh, fake game, the three C's are actually perfect. It's never happened, but let's just pretend. And so now you want to deprioritize that and reprioritize other things. And you want to start shuffling components around to make sure that your coverage is moving to a feature of the game that maybe needs a little bit more help. And this is a conversation that you need to be having constantly with your developers to make sure that your priorities are right. Uh, and all that comes back to keeping it alive. And then hopefully, uh, what we all hope for, making dope games. That's it. Thank you so much. All right. Hello. Is that working? It sounds like it is. Uh, quick question for you. Yeah. Um, so you work with multiple teams. Yeah. That, that um, spreadsheet you shared is really useful for that single team working on that single game. How do you sort of get a bigger picture across all the games, all the teams, all needing to use the same labs at the same time? I would love to say that I have a third spreadsheet for everybody today because I know how excited you all get about spreadsheets. Uh, but I don't, the way that I do that, um, 
at her, back home, like, is I put them in a calendar. Like, so, because I don't think it, these are all done by the people responsible for the game that they're working on. And so they, you know, I'll get a copy of all of them and then I sort of extract all the dates and put it all together in a master document of my own. And that gives me sort of the long-term visibility that I need from a manager's perspective. Um, but yeah, I, it's not something that I expect the people doing this documentation to do. That's more on my end. And then uh, it's, yeah, it's really, I mean, it's a Confluence calendar. It's not a huge secret, but you go through. And I, you know, when I'm looking for that, if this is a 10,000 foot view of the game and how you're going to research it, my view is then 100,000 feet. So all I'm really looking for is very broad strokes, like how big are these studies, how long are they, where do they belong. And then if I see like, hey, we have like three products all finaling at the same time and they all need 20 person things, it at least gives me the foresight to go, oh, well, I should reach out to a vendor or I should talk to my building manager to see if I can grow my lab or, you know, there's other things like that. But it's, uh, there's not a lot of alchemy there. It's really just throw them all in, take, the, take that column, the one column, copy it a couple times and then check to see if there are any conflicts. I'm sure somebody in here is like, don't, there's a better way to do that and I'm glad to hear it later if you want to tell me over beers tonight, but that's the way I've been doing it. Hi, um, quick question. This is very global, like you just said, a 100,000 feet view of a whole project. Um, any tips on adapting this in a situation where the iteration speed is really high, bi-weekly sprints, very agile environment, with, with like major changes to the game happening bi-weekly in the worst case? In that case, I think potentially, and you know, I, I haven't done this, so off the cuff, my intuition would be you still want to do the strategic part, you still want to understand the game, but perhaps if you're already locked into a week-on-week -week testing schedule because the team has a very high UX maturity and they're like, we believe in this, let's just do it, a quick one, small one every week, you'll want to still do the component separation and make sure that you understand the game because there might be exercises that you haven't thought about on a week-by-week -week sprint because you get into this groove of, let's rerun it, we'll do it again and again and again, and then you get into this sort of quick iteration loop of, I'll just copy paste my test plan every week forever and help. So maybe you don't need a, a, the calendar because the calendar, you know, uh, supports some different types of thought exercise, but you definitely, I think, still want to be looking at the components. And then maybe it'll help you plan out like, which parts of the game should I be studying in which weeks to make sure that I'm getting good coverage of all the features and that I'm supporting the team the best way possible. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that actually makes sense, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, do I get to do one? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm interested in how much power you give to the teams to choose their own methodologies. Yeah. It's a conversation, I think. I mean, um, <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> It's a conversation, you know, we'll talk to them about it and if they want different things. I mean, ideally, like I mentioned, part of the goal of doing this ahead of the team starting to do it is that you are taking back a, the locus of control, right? And then if you can propose a solid plan with good methodologies, you're able to get ahead of any freight train of do the focus groups. Um, and so certainly that's part of the example that I mentioned of like, if you want to do weird stuff, throwing it in here where it's part of a holistic plan it looks a little less weird when you're like, oh, if this is important, then this is how I can help. And they'll go, oh, okay, that makes sense, sign off. And you can sort of sneak in some of the goofier things that you want to do that maybe you haven't done before, that 20% fudge factor uh, study, right? Um, but the earlier you can get that out there and the more you can talk about it in a, a holistic support sense, the, the less the team is likely to be you know, really fiddling with your methodology. And so I think, I mean, it's still, obviously, like, this is something that you're doing in collaboration with them. And I don't think the idea is to be like, ah, I'm going to do it all my way, right? The goal is to say, look, do you agree that this is the part of your game that is risky? Do you agree that this will get you good data? I'm the expert. I think it will. But if you want to talk to me about some other way, let's discuss it and then figure out where it fits. Super. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Oh, thanks. Hop around this way. Hi, sorry. Um, just to understand a little bit more about how user um, research works within WBIE, 
like you kind of mentioned your um, stakeholder meetings, like who would be the stakeholders that were working through the plan with you? So generally, actually in, in the document that I have as part of my intro, I actually call out all the stakeholders. That's part of my document is getting sign off on. And generally what I'll do is I will have uh, producers, designers, QA, telemetry, research, and publisher. And I'll make sure to go out and find who those people are and then I'll explain what each of their expectations and their roles are as part of the research process and say, look, production, I'm expecting you to validate budget and to get me builds and to make sure that we are on track. Designers, I'm expecting you prior to studies to help me figure out design questions and make sure that we are doing the right supportive tasks at the right time. Uh, QA, because it's always good to have QA people as core stakeholders of your research process because they can help you with hot fixes and smoke tests and, uh, you know, um, all different types of things. The telemetry person should be involved at, at all stages because you want to be working with them as closely as possible in order to get the most value out of each of your disciplines. And publishing shouldn't be involved because they're paying for all of it. Um, how is that initial choice to uh, do one of these studies for a particular game usually made? Who reaches out? Or like where does the whole thing start? Yeah, how do you decide X game is going to have a user testing uh, thing planned by our user yeah. research? I mean, uh, at least the way we work, we're, we're a little bit more proactive about it. I've, I've written research plans for teams that didn't want them. Okay. And they went, oh, that's nice. Uh, we'll talk later. And then, you know, we talked less than I had hoped. But, uh, I, you know, it can be a very good tool to, I'm, I'm being silly, but like it is a good tool to open a dialogue with a team rather than, hey, like, uh, can I run some tests? And they're like, well, I don't know who you are or what you do. Showing up with a plan and, and explaining to them, like, look, I've identified these core risks in your game that maybe you didn't recognize or maybe you didn't understand um, or that you didn't attribute much value to, but these are the ways that I can help you make those better is, is a very good opening conversation for a research group talking to a development team. Uh, and so, yeah, you can start from there. But, I th you know, it depends on the way that your organization works. Sometimes you're not allowed to, like, kick doors down and just talk to teams that somebody hasn't told you you're allowed to talk to. Sometimes the teams are the one kicking your door down and you're like trying to make this before a meeting happens that's already been scheduled for you. Uh, but there are, diff there, are, there are different ways that you can go about it. Break time. <laughs>